Happy Easter. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Would you stand? And we're going to just sing a song celebrating the Lion of Judah. Happy Easter. Um, so good to have all of you here this morning. And if you're visiting with us today, uh, I just hope that you feel welcome and at home uh, worshiping with us today. It's uh, just a, a special day. Um, and I don't know, I've been struck lately, I think, with just how, how much the resurrection really is the absolute center of our faith. And, and I feel like I've been, uh, or God's been allowing me to kind of see it in kind of a new way, and just, just how big the impact is, and, um, you know, the fact that people is in an age of skepticism, and uh, where, you know, it's all about kind of our modern way of thinking, and, and science, and all this stuff, that with every accusation that's brought against the Bible, there's not a good argument against the resurrection, and one of the one of the greatest evidences in favor of the resurrection is just the radical change that took place in the lives of these disciples who went from being cowardly and uneducated and timid and um, foolish, on, honestly, to being these bold leaders of the faith to articulate the, the message of the gospel with such power and clarity. Um, so this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I'm not going to read, actually, the resurrection passage, but I really want to look at the impact, because that's really what's um, been striking me, is the impact of the resurrection on these disciples. Um, so this is Peter, who, as we saw Thursday night in that clip from The Passion, you know, he had just, weeks ago, uh, said three times, I don't know Jesus, 
he, I don't know this guy. And this is him now in front of a multitude of people. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man clearly attested to you by God with powerful deeds, wonders, and miraculous signs that God performed among you through him. Just as you yourselves know, this man who was handed over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you executed by nailing him to a cross at the hands of Gentiles. But God raised him up, having released him from the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. For David says about him, I saw the Lord always in front of me, for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not leave my soul to Hades, nor permit your Holy One to experience decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of joy with your presence. Brothers, I can speak confidently to you about our forefather David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So then, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, David, by foreseeing this, spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his body experience decay. This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses of it. So then, exalted to the right hand of God, and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that's just powerful, and that's, that's the core of our faith. That's why we have the hope we do, because um, Jesus is alive. Um, before we continue in worship, just one uh, announcement to point out, and I do encourage you to read the bulletins, um, but we are hosting the Rosedale Corral next Sunday, and we still need 12 people. We still need 12 um, of the choir to be hosted uh, for the night in host homes. So if you're interested and willing to host somebody, talk to my father right here, and uh, he will give you more information. All right? Let's go to prayer. Father, we're just so thankful this morning that you've given us a living hope, and you've given us a Savior who did not stay dead. Um, God, the, re the resurrection is just the proof of your power. It's the proof of the sufficiency of Jesus' death as payment for our sins. Um, and it's proof that one day we will rise with you as well. And we just ask that you would help us, uh, just, just fill us with your joy this morning. Give us freedom to just worship and um, just be joyful in your presence this morning. And we just praise you for the work of the cross and the, the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand, and we're just going to sing a song that's a little bit more reflective. Um, I, I know that we, we hear often about the blood of Jesus, and, and yet I think sometimes we miss the power that is in the blood and, and what it really means for us. It is the price of our redemption. It is the price of our freedom. We have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, there's a big gap. And the only price that was sufficient to the Father to pay for that was the blood of Jesus. So we're gonna uh, sing a song just um, appreciating, thanking Jesus for his blood. If you know this, sing with us. If you wanna just close your eyes and worship, uh, however you wanna express that. But thank Jesus for his blood. Hey, the 
Yeah. 
so much, Father, for your precious son, his precious blood, for all that that has provided for us today. We thank you so much that Jesus, your son, did not stay in a grave, but he has risen again. He has, he has made alive, and he has offered that same resurrection life and power to us uh, with which to conquer sin and live in your eternal life. We are so grateful for that. And now I just ask that... Um, your Holy Spirit would speak powerfully through Pastor Matt this morning. I pray that you would give him clarity to communicate and much grace as he speaks the word to us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome. Happy Easter and Christ is risen. Yeah, absolutely. It is just good to be together this morning and to see all of you. And as I was standing there and listening to you guys sing, it just made me think of this is a little bit what heaven's going to be like. Just to hear that beautiful singing and, and worshiping. And it's just incredible to hear that. Um, I could have just sat here all morning and, and listened to you guys sing instead of making you guys listen to me. I think that would have probably been better. But it was incredible. Thank you, Sam, for leading us in worship and the praise team. It is so good to be this morning. I love seeing people worshiping Jesus like we did this morning. And to see so many people come together and to celebrate Jesus and who he is and celebrate the risen Lord. He is risen. He is alive. But the truth is that this morning, there are a lot of people that have a hard time to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Because some of you here this morning and a lot of people struggle to fully believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that believe in the resurrection of Jesus in some distant way, but it's never been something that they have brought into the fullness of themselves and live out of that reality. We believe it, but it's just so distant. We can't grasp it. We can't understand it fully. And it's hard to celebrate what isn't real for us. We have questions about the resurrection. Or questions about the resurrection are extremely common in the Christian faith. And in the early church, even the disciples themselves, if you go back through and you read the Gospels, you see that they struggle with this concept of the resurrection. Even when they find the empty grave, they struggle to grasp it and believe it. Even when the women say they saw Jesus and they talked with him and they touched him, the disciples said what to them? This is nonsense. And they didn't believe it. And even Thomas said the only way that I'm going to believe it is if he stands in front of me and I can touch his physical body and put my hands and see the holes in his hands. 
and touch his side. There's so much doubt, so much struggle to believe in the idea of the resurrected king. And like Quentin said this morning, there's no good argument against it, but yet it's hard to grasp it. And so we have all these, these questions. And it's difficult for us to wrap our mind around the resurrection. And the early church struggled heavily to comprehend the fullness, to comprehend the fullness of what it means that Jesus conquered death. And there were so many people in the early church and still today that believe in the death of Jesus, in the teaching of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, in the works of Jesus, the supernatural power to heal the sick in Jesus, and believe that even Jesus died on the cross. Because we can believe in his death. That makes sense to us. We believe in the struggles that he had in the garden. We could, that makes sense to us. We, our lives are full of struggles. And so we can grasp that. We can understand that. But we struggle to fully believe, to fully grasp the resurrection and believe it in such a way that it changes our lives and the way that we live. And so Paul writes a letter dealing with the power of the resurrection to the Corinthians. And so you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know in the bulletin it said Luke 24. God led me to a different direction after I had told the secretary what, we're, what I'm going to be speaking on. And so we'll be out of 1 Corinthians 15. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. I'm not going to go through it verse by verse. We're just going to kind of, kind of work through the passage. And what we're going to see here that Paul is addressing people who reject Jesus altogether, reject the gospel in general, and therefore reject the resurrection. And he's writing to people who believe He's also writing to people who believe in Jesus, believe that Jesus died for their sins, but they can't wrap their minds around the resurrection. And then he's writing to a third group of people who believe in the gospel, fully believe in the death of Jesus, the burial and the resurrection, but in such a distant way that it has no effect on their life. You see, the resurrection, if true, changes everything for us. Everything. Everything. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And so he writes to all three of these with encouragement and a challenging message. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I, <clears throat> excuse me, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you, as most important, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures." And what do we see here? Paul's saying, this is what is first important, more than anything else. Everything else is secondary issues. He says at first is that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is not just that Jesus Christ came to die, but that he came to die for our sins and was raised to life again. He said that Christ died for our sins. This is the heart of the gospel. Romans 5, 8 says, but God proves his own love for us that in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And John 3, 16, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's why Jesus came into the world. Because you and I, we're enslaved to sin. We were condemned. There was pain. There was destruction and chaos that comes out of sin. And you and I couldn't save ourselves. And instead of just letting the world go to itself or destroying the world, God loved the people so much, loved the people that he created. You and I, instead of letting us die in our sins, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to pay the price for them so that they could experience, so that you and I could experience true, genuine life through faith in Jesus. He sent Jesus to rescue us, to save us. Jesus came to pay the price for you and I. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. We sang that this morning. Incredible, incredible song. Are you grateful? 
this morning for the blood? Or are you just grateful this morning on Sunday morning for the blood, but the rest of the week you don't really think about it too much? How grateful are you really? See, our lives should be transformed because of the blood. It should affect us in every aspect, not just Sunday mornings. I'm going to keep reading 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 17. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Paul says that without the resurrection, there is no hope for us, because death is still king. Death is still what rules over mankind. That nothing and nobody, no matter who you are, can conquer death. You and I can't conquer death on our own. And so he says there's no hope if Christ hasn't risen. And he says that that would mean that if only for this life, in verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are of most people to be pitied. And I believe he's laying this groundwork to speak to this lifestyle, to speak to the church, the people struggling with the resurrection and to believe the resurrection and to live like they believe in the resurrection. And I think he's addressing it because of a primary issue, an issue that you and I, that I deal with today, that ultimately what we want is we want Christianity without a king. We want Christianity without a king. And this is what Paul is looking at. He says that people who believe in or adhere to Jesus on some level but don't believe in the resurrection or believe it maybe on some distant level and don't let it be the thing that causes us to worship Jesus, that ultimately we, become, we get to this place where, where we want the message of the gospel without the sacrifice of the gospel. We hear the gospel, we hear the good news of the gospel, we hear the reality of the idea of freedom from sin and forgiveness of sin and not having any condemnation and not having any guilt and without shame and being set free and experiencing grace and mercy, and we want that, right? We want that. We want the blessings of the cross, but we just don't want the resurrection. We want the blessings of God, but we just don't want a God to worship or to live for every day. We want the work of Christ on the cross. We want the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We want the death of Jesus and the blessing that comes from that. But we don't want the resurrected king to have to live for and serve every day. You see, we're okay with the suffering of Jesus. But we don't ever have to want to suffer for him or with him. We want the cross and the blessing of the cross and the freedom of the cross and the grace of the cross and the forgiveness of the cross, but we struggle with the idea of the resurrected king, which requires us to serve fully and to live and to worship. Because here's the thing. If he's conquered sin for us and he's conquered death for us, then that would make Jesus worthy of everything we could ever do in this life. Right? Right? If he's conquered sin and he's conquered death, there's nothing left to conquer. If Jesus is who he says he is and he died on the cross, shed his blood and rose again, and he lives at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us on our behalf, then Jesus is worthy of all our worship, praise, and adoration. He is worthy of being king in your life. He is worthy of being everything. And the question this morning is, are you giving him your everything? You see, it's the resurrection that makes that possible. It's the resurrection that causes us to have to worship him, to give him everything, because he is God and he is everything. 
He shed his blood for you and I, and he rose again. There is nothing, no one greater than Jesus. And if you're like me, sometimes you struggle with the idea of loving Jesus and wanting his love in return without having to reciprocate that love. And I've lived there so much in my life and sometimes still find myself there. Because most of us struggle with truly comprehending what it means to live for the God who created us and Jesus who died for us. We hear the gospel and believe it just like Peter, John, and the other disciples as well as, well as many in the Corinthian church. And that's why Paul says, I'm reminding you of the gospel because you've already heard it and you've already believed it, but you've got to a place where you're living like you don't believe in the resurrection or you don't believe in it, period. Are you living and worshiping as if you believe that the king is resurrected? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? Does that mean just coming to church on a Sunday morning? Is that it? In verse 33, he explains how we get there. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Do not be deceived. The Greek word says, do not be misled. It has this idea of roaming or wandering. In other words, Paul is saying here, we can get so easily caught up chasing after our own passions and desires. I don't believe he's talking about totally disowning Jesus and walking away from the faith here. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we just get caught up chasing our own wants, our own desires, our own passions. When it comes to our relationship with Jesus, that we get so enamored with our own passion and desire, and it overtakes us, and it starts to overshadow our relationship with Jesus and our thoughts about Jesus, and we roam away from him and go astray from him. That's what the idea that he's saying here. So it's not that we have abandoned the faith, We've just abandoned that intimate relationship with Jesus, chasing our own desires and our own passion, living our life every day for ourselves. And so right here in this middle of this chapter, he starts to transition where he's talking to people who believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection in some distant way, but they've been mis misled and they're going this way, chasing their own desires. And then he makes this statement, do not be misled because bad company corrupts good morals or bad company corrupts good character. And we hear this saying, if you grew up like I did, you hear this saying a lot. Bad company corrupts good character, good morals. We've all heard that. This is where it comes from. This was common in the Greek and Jewish and Roman world. And the word morals there is this word ethos. It literally means like your daily lifestyle like how you live your life on a day-to-day -day basis, the decisions that you make, who you are as a person every day. And so the heart of what he's saying here is that we are being influenced, we are being impacted by the culture, by a culture who doesn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And the culture is literally telling you and I how to live, how to live your life in the world telling you and I and giving you passions to go chase and desires to go live. They're telling you what success is. They're telling you what you should think about. They're telling you how you should invest your time and your energy and your resources, your money, telling you what life is about. And you're literally, we are literally getting enamored with it. And then he goes on to verse 34 and he says this, come to your senses and stop sinning. For some people are ignorant about God. I say this, to your shame. The Greek means here to rise up. Rise up out of your stupor. Don't be led astray. Bad company corrupts good morals. Now wake up. Wake up, church. 
That's what he's telling us. Because the church has become so enamored by culture. The American church has become so enamored by culture. I have become so enamored by culture. We have bought into what they're selling us, telling us, and giving us things to be passionate about in this life. The desires that we should have. And it's causing our hearts and our minds to go focus on these passions and these desires. The church has got caught up chasing the desires and the passions of a culture. A culture who has told us what's important and yet they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And over a period of days and weeks, months and years, it begins to lead us astray of an intimate relationship with Jesus and we lose the power that Christ came to give us, that the resurrection gives us. And you can hear the urgency as Paul pleads with them to wake up, but he doesn't do it in a condemning way. He's just pleading with them, and I'm pleading with you this morning, and I'm pleading to myself. It's time for us as a church. It's time for myself. It's time for you all to wake up. To understand and to live and worship the resurrected king and give him what he deserves. And that is all of ourselves. Every aspect of our life. So we see through chapter 15 the heart of what Paul is building up to. He says, I want you to see the true victory that Jesus has really given to us. And that's why he says, if you're only following Jesus for this temporary world, you're missing the significant power of what Jesus actually did, what he truly did for us. And in verses 35 to 49, I'm not going to take time to read it, Paul recognizes And I want us to recognize that life is real. We have things that we have to deal with. We have jobs and careers, and we have to put food on the table. We've got decisions to make, and life goes on. And we have have a life here, and he's not negating that, and I'm not negating that this morning as well. But what he's trying to get us to see is that none of that stands in comparison to the victory that Christ truly has for us, and that is over death. See, the truth is the thing that we struggle to really comprehend and really understand, the thing that nobody can argue with, you can't argue with it this morning, that death is real. We are all going to die. It is the thing that truly makes life worthless in some sense. Because no matter what you accomplish, no matter what you achieve or what you build, it's all going to get stolen from you in some sense. Solomon says, who was the wisest man on earth, says that everything, everything is useless. Why? Because you're going to die. We're all going to die. Everything in this life is useless. And so many of us work hard to save up a couple hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred bucks, a couple million dollars. That's the goal, right? Save up all this money, and yet Solomon says, it's useless. It's worthless, because you're all going to die. There's nothing you will do in this life, in the temporary earthly life, in the materialistic way, that death will not steal it from you. And what Paul is trying to get us to understand, he's trying to get us to understand that if you could just take your eyes off the temporariness of this world and these temporary things and just put our eyes on Jesus, that's the greatest victory. That's the greatest victory that we have on the cross and the resurrection is over death itself. One day, we heard ourselves singing here, but one day we will live in eternity singing and worshiping Jesus together. And it's only because of the resurrection. And if we look at verse 54, he says this, death 
has been swallowed up in victory. And he quotes this psalm from David. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just over sin, not just over temporary things of this world, but he has given us victory over death itself. Do you understand that? He's given you victory over death. We don't have to fear death anymore. We will live with him in eternity, forever. And I believe he said this because the tendency of our heart is to drift and to go astray and chase culture, chase the passions and desires of the world because we tend not to think about the reality of the victory of Jesus that we have forgiveness of sins, that we have grace, that there's no more condemnation in our life, that we have absolute freedom, that we are sons and daughters of God, and that we have victory over death. And that means that Jesus is this living and active king. He's risen. He's alive. He is active. And we have absolutely nothing to fear in this life. We have victory over death. And so we are living for something greater than what culture tells us. We are living for something as great as eternity with God. And that makes every single thing here, every second here on this earth matter. And that's what gives life purpose. That's what gives you purpose. That's where joy comes from. That's where real peace comes from. We can stop chasing all the things of this world because we know what we're living for. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that you labor, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. It's not useless. The point is he's saying transfer your passions and your desires back to Jesus because there's nobody, nothing more valuable or more worthy of worship and adoration and fully living our life for than Jesus Christ. There's nothing who's going to satisfy you like living for Jesus Christ. There's nothing that's going to give you joy like living for Jesus Christ. There's nothing that's going to give you peace than to live for Jesus Christ. And part of the reason why so many of us are miserable is because we don't fully give ourselves to Jesus Christ. This world is always, always going to let you down. No matter what you chase, it's never going to satisfy us. No matter what our passion is, it's always going to lead to disappointment. It's been proven over and over and over again. And Paul says, turn your heart back fully to Christ. And what Paul is saying here was a message that Jesus gave over and over and over again. The message of the gospel, the message of the New Testament is that Christ has the ultimate victory. But no matter where you are at in life, no matter how far you have drifted away, no matter how far you're away from home, Christ is always saying, come back. And we remember that story of the prodigal son, right? It's a beautiful picture of God's love for us. And I can just imagine, no matter where you're at in life, Jesus is always looking, looking out. Is my son, is my daughter returning back to me to have an intimate relationship with me? That's the heart of God. Christ accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished on the cross. He defeated death and the grave through his resurrection. There's no greater purpose than to live for Jesus. And he loves you with everything. And he did this for you, and he wants you. He's pleading with you, come back to me. Come back to me. I love you. I want you. I want to have a relationship with you. He's waiting for you. And the best way that you and I can celebrate the resurrection of Christ this morning is to come back to him. Is to surrender everything to him. Not just Sunday morning. Not just Wednesday nights, 
but every day of the week. The best way to honor and glorify Jesus is to fully commit your life to him. That's the best way. And if Jesus died and he rose again, then he is worthy of everything. Everything. He's worthy of your adoration and worship. This morning, we're going to transition here. In your bulletins, you have an insert with three prompts in there. And we're going to give you an opportunity. Also, we're given some post-it notes. If you don't, there's some extras up here. There's some in the back on the tithing boxes. Um, or you can raise your hand. The ushers will give you some. And we just want to give you an opportunity this morning to write on your post-it notes things that God has done in your life, these God moments. We're going through Joshua right now as a church, and this idea is the stones of remembrance. So we'll give you an opportunity to do that or surrender a sin, a pattern in, of behavior or an area of life that you recognize. Maybe this morning you recognize some things that you need to just commit to Jesus and to surrender. Maybe it's to trust God for something that seems impossible. Maybe you're going through something extremely difficult this morning. And you want to just surrender that and give that to God. I want you to know that God cares deeply about whatever difficult thing that you're going through. And he hears your heart's cry. And he cares. So we're going to play a song. And during that song, you can just make your way. There's a cross up here. You could, make, you could stick the post-it notes right on the cross. If you can't walk up the steps and you want to just lay it on the steps, that's fine. We'll just give you an opportunity to, to surrender those things to, to Jesus. If you want to come up here afterwards and just pray, that's fine. If you don't feel comfortable coming up and you want to just stay in your seats and just reflect and pray and worship Jesus during this moment, whatever you feel comfortable with is what we want to do this morning. I want to have a word of prayer, and then we'll play this song. After the song, then Sam will come back up and lead us in two more songs of praise. Shall we pray? God, this morning, I'm deeply humbled and honored to be here. And yet as I studied and I processed these things, I became aware, even in my own life, of how much I live for myself, chasing passions and desires. And yet when I read the scripture and I see everything that you went through, all the suffering that you went through, the death that you, that you went through for me and my sins, the shedding of your blood, and then you rose again, God, you deserve all my honor, all my glory, all my worship and adoration. Yet so often, I spend life chasing after my own wants, my own desires, and my own dreams. And God, I know that you care about our dreams and our passions and our desires. It's not that you don't want us to chase those things and, and have desires and passions, but you want to be first and most important in my life, that those things do not become the idol that takes us away from you. God, I know that you want to bless us, but so often the blessings that we have become idols in our lives. God, help me, help all of us here this morning to surrender everything to you, to make you king of our lives, the centerpiece of our lives, because you deserve it, you're worthy of it, because you are God and you created us and you love us. Help us to worship you, not just this morning, but every day of the week in every aspect of our lives. Praising you and glorifying you through everything that we do. God, I just pray a blessing upon each person represented here today, each family represented here today, and you bless them. If they're struggling through something difficult, God, would you just touch their heart? 
Will you wrap your arms around them? May they feel your presence in a powerful way, and your love in a powerful way. If they're struggling with sin, God, would they just be willing to surrender that all to you, knowing that you are standing with open arms offering forgiveness? It's already been taken care of. It is finished. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
continue to just kind of step out and attach those notes to the cross somewhere. You can do that during this song. I'm going to sing two more songs, and they're songs of celebration, but especially this one is also continuing that same thought of, of responding to what Jesus says. You called my name, and because you called my name, I ran out of that grave in the shadow that I was under, whatever that is. I'm making a choice to say I don't actually have to live anymore because I have to live there anymore because the life of Jesus sets me free from that. So let's worship, but also continue to, to attach those notes if you want to. buried beneath my shame who could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not
this week about my friend Mark Rice stepping into the next, the next step, eternity. And it's because of hope in Jesus. And, I, you know, that time's going to come for all of us. And it may be soon. And the one thing we stand on is that we have a living hope. And as we sing this, I just encourage you to let this be your foundation um, today. But as you enter another, another year past Easter and apply these things in your life, let's just rejoice together. Declare the grave has no claim. 